Hit the button. Yay! This would be Thursday, May 21st, third period, as we're going to talk about the end of the book, and maybe some bonus information. Let's first see how the day goes. Uh, see information up there, target challenge. Hopefully we get to win our first target challenge of the year. Uh, the test will be tomorrow. Uh, candy, the, the characters. All right. Um, as far as the end of the book goes, to go through and talk about that, I want to read uh, two scenes with you and then sort of talk about how the end of it goes. One of the scenes I want to read is when they find Eminem and what's going on with him. And then I want to read the scene where Mark and Brian end up having... <coughs> Sorry, press on Mark and Brian end up throwing down and having a wee bit of a fight. The scene with Eminem, well, first off, where do they find Eminem? At the uh, hippie house. House. At the hippie house. Nice hippie done. House. Uh, let's see, hippie house. Uh, we, got, we got beat up, so it's here at the end. Hippie house. Thanks for no. yeah, Hippie house. Aha. Uh-huh. So page 136. And that's where they end up. He takes Kathy back with them, and they go to the hippie house to go find Eminem. But when they find Eminem, there are issues, to say the very least. Now, this is where I'm on page 136 on the left-hand side towards uh, the bottom, where it says the two Volkswagen buses. I'm going to begin there, and we'll just sort of go forward. There were two Volkswagen buses parked in the driveway of the old house. I knew they belonged to the hippies because of the flowers and slogans painted on them. One read, war is unhealthy for children and other living things. Really bright. This is where he is. Kathy sighed. I still can hardly believe that baby's living in a place like this. I guess big sisters always think of little brothers as babies, no matter how old they are. Maybe it was good for him. Maybe being on his own made him grow up a little. I read this part with you guys yesterday? Yeah. yeah. How far did I give it to you guys? You got to the part when he said Travel he was late. floating. That's where it was. All right, so let's see. Uh, talk to the trap. So we're on the bus. I forgot that with you guys. Page 137. We'll jump over to the right-hand side. Talk to his travel agent. And what's the travel agent? They that travel. Close. That was where I missed you guys with the slang. I changed things after your guys' class. Um, they talk about a number of bits of slang from the 70s in there. One, they talk about um, floating. And if you're floating, what does that mean? You're high. That you're high. And they say that you're flying, which means you're really, you're really high. Because flying is apparently higher than floating. Uh, this is the same idea. And then a travel agent is someone that sends you to go get high. You see a travel agent, you get on a plane and you go high, travel agent. So what is a travel agent going to be? Drug dealer. And so the travel agent would be a drug dealer because they're someone that sells you the stuff that makes you go high. And so when he says talk to his travel agent, I mean go talk to his drug dealer, the person who gives him the drugs that makes him go high. Let's see. Talk to his travel agent, the hippie said. He's the cat with the red hair inside. Travel agent? Well, what's that? Kathy whispered as we went in. I didn't want to tell her. Didn't want her to feel the sudden cold waves of fear that I was feeling. So I said, I don't know. We found who we were looking for. A big, heavy guy with fire-colored hair, beard, and mustache. We're looking for Baby Freak, I said. I was beginning to see why Eminem had acquired this other nickname. Most of the kids there were at least 17 or 18, with a lot of college-age kids. It was a real crowded place. But now I can't remember what everyone was doing. At least some of the kids were smoking grass. You could tell that by the smell. I was hoping the place didn't get raided while we were there. You can get busted just for being at a place where people are smoking pot. Yeah? Man, that kid's on a bad trip. Kathy made a funny, yelping little sound. Uh, a trip is not just when you're high, but specifically when you're on LSD. Uh, the hallucinogen that makes you see things. They call it tripping. And so I'm saying he's on a bad trip means he's having a really bad time with it. Um, real quick, so one of the things when people talk about the drugs with uh, LSD and acid specifically, it makes you see things that aren't there. And so um, stuff like you can have a conversation with a teddy bear, and the teddy bear will have a conversation back with you, and you can just sit there and say, "Hi, Mr. Teddy Bear," just like Ted the movie, and the cat, the cat, the animal will sit there and talk, and you be like, "Oh," and it sounds like lots of fun. The problem is. You can't control what your brain will do. And there's every chance that your brain will start telling you that the teddy bear is going to start chewing on your arm. And when the teddy bear starts chewing on your arm, it feels real. You'll feel the teddy bear chewing on your arm, which freaks you out. And then that's what causes people to like jump out windows, run into traffic, because you start to see things that are happening and stuff like that, and it really freaks you out. And you can't control which way your brain's going to go. So if your brain has a bad trip, that's when you start to see things that scare you. And the more it scares you, the worse it gets. So whatever's happening to Eminem, 
he's having a bad one, where he's seeing really bad stuff happening to him. Some of these freaks have been dropping acid. Baby wanted to try it, so I sat with him. Bad trip, man. Really bad. He's calmed down a little now, but all day today me and some of these other cats have been holding him and keeping him from jumping out the window. I felt like I was going to throw up. Kathy was as white as a sheet. Can we see him? She said in a tiny expressionless voice. Sure. We followed him up the stairs. He led us to the same room Mark and I had gone to the last time we were there. This time, no one was there except the blonde chick who was curled up on the bed asleep and someone huddled in the corner. To my surprise, Red walked over to the huddle. Hey, man, there's people here to see you, he said softly. Are they spiders? The person didn't raise his head, but the voice was Eminem's. No, man, Red laughed gently. They're squares. Eminem looked up and I hardly recognized him. His hair was to his shoulders. He was a lot thinner. He was dirty. And the expression on his face was one I'd never seen on him before. Suspicion. Him and him, baby. It's me, Kathy. <sighs> Kathy kneeled down in front of him. He was staring at her, not seeing her. Square spiders, he said. And his face was contorted in fear. I don't want to see any spiders. It's me, Kathy, your sister. Don't you want to go home? I went to my stomach. Eminem said in a high, unnatural voice. He was talking too fast. I went down into my stomach, and all these spiders came out. I never knew there were spiders in my stomach. I was there ten years, and all that time these spiders kept chewing on me. They were big spiders. Kathy choked back a sob. Baby, what have you done to yourself? He seemed to see her. Kathy? I screamed and screamed and screamed, but nobody came to help me. He was shaking. He didn't look right. He looked sick. I kept trying to get back, but the spiders held me down, held me down and chewed on me, and the colors went in and out. I listened to the colors, and they were screaming too. Red and yellow screamed loudest. The spiders were eating them too. <coughs> he kept trying to jump out the window all day. We took turns holding him down. What did the guy want? A medal? He'd given him the stuff in the first place. Kathy, we ought to take him to the hospital. She looked at me quickly hospital? Then she nodded. Let me call Daddy first. She looked at Red. Do you have a phone I can use? She followed him out of the room. There was this other color? Him and him said to me seriously, but half afraid, as if he thought I'd turn into a spider any minute. I don't know its name. It told me, but I forgot. It said I was being paid back for all the carrots I ate. I didn't know. I thought, I didn't know about the carrots before. I don't think it was my fault. He was crying. Tears were pouring down his face, but he hadn't changed his expression. He looked so thin and scared. Not a bit like the Eminem I knew. Do you think I should be paid back for something I didn't know about? No, I said, clearing my throat. I don't think it was your fault. I put my arm around him and held him. He was shaking real bad. Kathy came back. Daddy's going to meet us at the hospital. Can you carry him? Yeah, I said. I picked him up easily. He couldn't have weighed more than 90 pounds. I'm so tired. I was gone so long, I didn't have any sleep. I carried him down the stairs and out of that house. Nobody made any move to stop me. Nobody seemed to care. Kathy drove us to the hospital. Halfway there, M&M start, started suddenly and screamed, Where am I? It's okay, kid. You're going to be okay. Where am I? Why don't I know where I am? I was just sick. I didn't know how Kathy was managing to drive the car. I never felt so bad before. I just held on to him and him. There wasn't any sense in trying to talk to him. I felt then that he was as much my little brother as Kathy's. That's how bad I felt. Mr. Carlson was waiting for us at the hospital. We drove right up to the emergency entrance, and there he was. I got out and picked him and him up again, but I didn't have him for long. Mr. Carlson took him and carried him into the hospital, holding him very close and very tight. All right, I'm going to stop there. So basically with m and he started trying different drugs, wanted to try LSD, and the problem was it messed him up really badly. LSD is one of those drugs where you can take it one time and it can have a pretty drastic effect on you because basically it goes straight into your spine, unlike uh, marathon, uh, marathon, marijuana, which goes into your um, lungs, or cocaine, which goes to your heart. LSD goes straight to your spine. Uh, when it goes into your spine, it stays there for a while and it can mess you up which is what they find out with um, Eminem. And then you find out that apparently from all of this, that it's messed him up for life, that he has brain damage, essentially, from 
taking the LSD and the fact of what it did to his brain and the fact that he's now sterile which means that he can never have kids ever again, that it's messed up his body bad enough that he's never going to be able to have children. Because if you did, they might come out to form because of what this drug did to him. Which goes against everything that Eminem wanted, because how many kids did Eminem want at the very well, beginning? Nine or ten. Yeah, like nine or ten kids, and now he's never going to get to have any. He was a super smart genius kid, now he's going to be uh, have the, the brain problem and stuff like that. With all that going into it, Brian gets really angry. Brian decides he wants to get revenge. Who does he blame for everything that happened to Eminem? Mark. The hippies and Mark. No, not Mark. The dad. 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 Not the dad either. Who? Well, what is it that messed up Eminem? Drugs. Drugs. So who's he gonna blame? Drugs. Yeah, the people who gave him the drugs. So what he wants to do is get revenge on the people who gave Eminem the drugs. So he gets upset, he gets angry, he decides that you know he wants to do something to try and fix all this, he wants to get try to get some kind of revenge. And if there's anything we've learned from the book so far, what have we learned about revenge? There's a lot of that. Yeah. That typically it leads to really bad stuff happening. Which is what occurs, because then once Brian gets home, he drops off Eminem, drops off Kathy, gets back to his house. He's sitting there in his bedroom in a fit of rage, and there he lifts up the mattress to try and get some cigarettes, because as everyone knows, smoking a cigarette calms you down, according to the book. Uh, but when he lifts up the mattress to get the cigarettes, uh, he doesn't find cigarettes. He finds something else, uh, and that's what we're going to jump to next, which is page... Page. There it is, page 144. And this is, he now has dropped off uh, Kathy, he has back home, he's sitting, he's trying to get through all the issues, lifts up the mattress, and... I was surprised to see how late it was when I got home. Mom was asleep. I went into my room, lay down without bothering to turn off the light. Mark wasn't home yet. I was tired. I felt empty and drained. Nothing can wear you out like caring about people. I was tired, yet I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep. I closed my eyes, but I kept seeing pictures. All these people were spinning around in my head. Mark and Charlie and Mike and Angela, Kathy and Eminem and Mr. Carlson and Tim and Curly Shepherd. Life had seemed so simple once. Now it suddenly seemed so complicated. I can remember a time when my only worry had been paying Charlie the three bucks I owed him. Things used to be simple, and now they weren't. I wanted a cigarette bad. I half-heartedly searched my pockets, but I knew I didn't have any. Then I remembered Mark's spare carton and rolled off the bed and reached under his mattress. I felt something strange and pulled it out. It was a long, cylinder-like thing. I unscrewed one end, and all these pills came rolling out. I'm not dumb, by any means. I've never used drugs, except for a couple of tries with grass, but I knew what they looked like. And I looked at this bunch of pills. There were hundreds of them. And it was like a machine in my head went click, click, click. And it came up with an answer I didn't want. Mark was selling this stuff. This wasn't, this was way too many pills for anybody to have if he was just taking them himself. And besides, I would have noticed something different about Mark if he'd been taking them. You can't use drugs and not show it. I knew too many kids who were users not to know that. Mark was selling. Mark was a pusher. That was where he was getting his money. That was why he'd known about the hippie house. That was why they had known him. That was why they had known where to look for Eminem. Eminem. Kathy. Eminem was in the hospital, and maybe he was messed up for life, and Mark was selling the stuff that made him that way. Maybe this wasn't LSD, but it was a step in that direction, and God only knows what all Mark had been selling. Go ahead and put it on my desk. I thought about that blonde, dead-looking chick, and about Eminem screaming about spiders, and about Kathy half hysterical with grief. I thought about Mr. Carlson and the bitter doctor, and the whole mess was swirling around in my head, and it felt like it would burst wide open. When I thought about the cause of all this misery, I became very cool, and I very calmly called the cops. Eminem had lost his mind, and Kathy was hurting, and I did something about it. And I sat down on a chair in the front room and waited. It seemed only a minute later when Mark came in. Hey, still up? He said. Then he stopped. What's the matter? Crying you look awful. What is it? I held out the cylinder. Oh, Mark said after a pause. You found him. Oh, well, don't worry, buddy. I don't take him. I have a good enough time just like I am. Just how are you anyway? 
What? Mark said, confused. Him and M's in the hospital. Acid trip. They think he may have lost his mind. Man, that's awful. That poor kid. Then he looked at me. Brian, don't look at me like that. I said I don't take them. Don't you believe me? I believe you. We needed the money, you know. I tried getting a job, but with my police record, nobody would have hired me. And then I met this guy on the ribbon, he set me up, and I figured I don't have to take it to sell it, so what's the worry? Eminem, I began, but I was too tired, too numb to talk. Is that what's bugging you? Listen, I didn't sell Eminem anything. He got it from somebody else. Look at Brian. They're going to get it from somebody if they want it. So why can't I make some money? I never forced on anybody. I never tried to talk somebody into using drugs so I could make a buck. He could have talked all night, and I wouldn't have changed my mind. This was wrong. For the first time in years, I thought about the golden-eyed cowboy who'd been Mark's father. Was Mark a throwback? To what? I wondered tiredly why I'd never seen it before. Mark had absolutely no concept of what was right and what was wrong. He didn't obey any laws because he couldn't see that there were any. Laws, <laughs> right and wrong, they didn't matter to Mark because they were just words. Brian, what is it? Listen, if it bugs you that much, I'll quit. I'll stop selling if you don't like it. Shoot, I never thought it'd bother you. I sort of thought you knew about it. Don't you drag me into this, I thought. Don't try to make me out to be blind just because you are. Aloud, I said. I called the cops. And I felt as if I was talking in my sleep. Mark went white. What? He said softly, disbelievingly. What'd you say? We could already hear the siren. Brian, you know what something like this would do to me with my record. Brian, tell me you're lying. Mark was pleading desperately. I thought maybe he'd run for it, but he didn't. He just sat down in the chair opposite me. He was white. His eyes were black with a rim of gold around them. He looked the way he had when he'd been clobbered with that bottle. Brian, he said quietly, like he was trying hard to understand, like he was totally confused, like he thought maybe I would answer in a foreign language. Why are you doing this to me, buddy? Brian, just, just tell me. I couldn't tell him. I, I didn't know. The police arrived, and of course Mom woke up. She didn't know what was going on. She could only stand helpless in the kitchen doorway while the police questioned me rounded up the drugs, and slapped handcuffs on Mark. They advised Mark of his right to remain silent, and he did. He just stood there, quivering, watching me while I told the cops the things that would put him behind bars for years. Then the cops said, Let's go, kid. And it seemed to dawn on Mark what was happening. He looked quickly from the cops to me and cried, My God, Brian, you're going to let them take me to jail? Didn't he know? I just put him there. The cop jerked Mark around, shoved him out the door. <coughs> Suddenly, it was deadly quiet, just the distant siren and Mom's quiet sobbing. I went into the bathroom and threw up. I was sick. <clears throat> when I told you about that this was the book that made me cry, that was the scene that did it for me. And the reason it did was, for me, reading the book, it was that neither one of them is really in the wrong. Neither one of them is trying to be evil. Mark sold drugs. And, and we talked about a little thing at the very beginning. Is he selling drugs to be me? No. What's his intention in selling drugs? Money. Because his money, his family's starving. His family is poor. They don't have money. Will anyone hire him? No. no. He has a record. But if he wants to support his family, he has to do something. So he does the only thing he can to support his family. It's the equivalent of if you have a baby that's starving and you steal bread from a store to feed your starving baby, is it wrong? No. Well, it's one of those things, well, yeah, it's against the law, but is it wrong? Same thing happens with Mark. Mark's not trying to be evil. Mark's only trying to help out the family. And, of course, Brian. Brian is turning into a drug dealer. Isn't turning into a drug dealer the right thing to do? So he's also trying to do the right thing. And for me, it was seeing the fact that you have these two friends who are best friends who are both trying to do the right thing. And no matter how much they try to do the right thing, it turns out to be the wrong thing. And the fact that it ends up destroying both of their lives. And that's what I saw. For me, I had friends when I was in late junior high, 8th grade into early high school, who did drugs. And I was fully aware of it. And I saw this in their lives. And the fact that I could easily see this being a choice I could make. And for me, that's why it hit me so hard. 
And with Brian, this goes all the way back to that story between Mike and Connie. With Connie making a choice she knew was wrong and crying while she did it, feeling guilty while she did it, but doing it anyway. Here at the very end, Brian makes that choice, knowing it's the wrong choice, but at the same time, it's something he feels he has to do. Why? What's his motivation for doing it? What caused him to call the police? The idea of doing that revenge thing. Going back for Eminem. The same reason that Connie ended up having her brothers beat up Mike. And that's why he then, Brian, immediately turns around and then goes and throws up. It's because of all that guilt that happens. Now, from there, the last chapter, Brian feels so guilty, he decides he has to punish himself. And part of the punishing of himself is the fact that he does not feel he deserves any happiness in his life because he feels that he's destroyed his best friend's life, which he has. So that's why he becomes a jerk and an absolute horrible person to Kathy. Uh, and he is mean to Kathy, and Kathy breaks up with him. So why is he mean to Kathy at the end? Because he feels guilty. He feels he does not deserve to have her because of what he did. Now, I also want to read the very end of it, because part of his guilt is he decides to go see Mark while Mark's in jail. If you remember, at the very beginning, with the whole Mike and Connie thing, Mark made a statement at the end of that chapter, I said it would be foreshadowing, and Mark said something about if anybody ever heard him, how would Mark feel? Let's go back and take a look at it. Read it real quick to you. It's at the end of chapter, end of chapter two on page forty-two. Right after the whole Mike and Connie thing, we're having a conversation, and Brian's like, "Yeah, I can understand how he'd feel." Mark goes, "Yeah, I mean it, man. If anybody ever hurt me like that, I'd hate them for the rest of my life." I didn't think much about that statement then, but later I would. I still do. I think about it think about it until I think I'm going crazy. That's referring to the decision that Brian makes with Mark later on. So then, to jump to the very end, we have page 156, and this is where he goes to go see him. One night, when I was lying on the floor reading a book, Mom came in and sat down. Brian, you got even with Mark for Kathy. Then you got even with Kathy for Mark when you broke up with her. When are you going to stop getting even with yourself? I rolled over and got up and went for a drive. I couldn't talk to Mom, especially when she was telling the truth. Finally, at the end of August, I got to see Mark. He couldn't leave the reformatory, so I had to go in. He'd been in so much trouble that the authorities considered my visit a last-ditch effort to straighten him out. If it didn't work, they were going to send him to the state prison. They told me they hoped I could influence him. They didn't say how. I thought we'd have to talk through a wire dealie like you see in prison movies, but instead, we were left alone in a room which I remember as strangely empty. Hiya, buddy, Mark greeted me. Slummin'? I couldn't speak. I had a real bad pain in my throat. Mark had changed. He'd lost a lot of weight, but somehow it had stretched his skin over his bones and slanted his eyes. He hadn't lost his looks, but exchanged them. He looked dirty somehow and hard, <coughs> things I'd never seen in him before. His strangely sinister innocence was gone, and in its place was a more sinister knowledge. He seemed to be pacing, like an impatient, dangerous, caged lion. How, how goes it? I managed finally. What's the action like in here? I told you how it was in here. You'd be sick. There was a silence. Then he continued. I didn't have to see you. I wanted to, though. I had to make sure. Make sure of what? Make sure I hated you. I suddenly remembered that time so long ago when Kathy had looked at Mark and felt for a moment that I had hated him. I wondered what it felt like to experience that feeling all your life, to hate the person you loved best. Mark, Mark, I, Mark, I didn't know what I was doing. Can it, buddy? He glanced around. It's a groovy place, ain't it? Seems like home now. I, I hear you've been causing trouble. Yeah, I don't seem to be able to get away with things anymore. I thought I'd break down and cry then, but I didn't. Listen. You straighten up, and they'll let you out early on probation or parole or whatever it is, and you can come home. I'll get you a job at the store. Like hell you will, Mark said, in the same easy, pleasant voice he used all along. And I ain't never going back there again. When I get out of here, you ain't never going to see me again. We were like brothers. You were my best friend. He laughed then, and his eyes were the golden, hard, flat eyes of a jungle animal. Like a friend once said to me, that was then, this is now. I broke out in a sweat and was suddenly glad of the walls and the guards and the bars. I think if he could have, Mark would have killed me. 
I haven't tried to see Mark since then. I heard in a roundabout way that he was sent to the state prison. I've just been sort of waiting around for school to start, not caring whether or not it does. I don't seem to care about anything anymore. It's like I'm worn out with caring about people. I don't even care about Mark. The guy who was my best friend doesn't exist any longer, and I don't want to think about the person who's taken his place. I go over everything that happened last year, trying to figure out what I could have done different, what I would do different if I had that chance, but I don't know. Mostly I wonder, what if? What if I'd found out about Mark some other time, when I wasn't half out of my mind with worry about Kathy? What if I hadn't met her in the first place? Would I still have grown away from Mark? What if Eminem had been a good trip instead of a bad one? What if someone else had turned Mark in? Would there still be hope for him? I'm too mixed up to really care. And to think, I used to be so sure of things. Me, once I had all the answers, I wish I was a kid again when I had all the answers. And that's the depressing end of the book. Um, which is one of the reasons why I liked it. It doesn't try to wrap it up with a happy note. It doesn't try to come back and tell you what to do. It just says this is their life, and it kind of sucked with all of their choices. Tomorrow, um, I ran out of time today. I needed like six more minutes, and we ran out. I'm going to give you guys more of the connection to my life and how it connects there at the end. But we'll also have the test. We'll pack in a lot. But tomorrow is a longer class period because we don't have best tomorrow, so I'll have more time with you guys. Uh, let's go ahead and bring up books 21 through 30. What?